recorder got a recording today because well, Mitch and I both had technical difficulties. Mine was. Maybe I'll get one because I just realized I didn't bring it in. Which is a, is a machine error. His recorder ran out of battery power and mine was a brain error. I forgot to turn my on. <laughs> Most everything in my life has turned out to be operator error. <laughs> so again, I'd like to ask everybody to just turn face this way. We have more of a dialogue. And um, once again, this is the <coughs> May Zazenkai, Savannah, Georgia, May 4th, 2013. And our subject matter is uh, Zen and creativity. Creativity and Zen. Creativity and creativity. Zen and Zen. And before, in the afternoon talk, we surveyed the, the membership and asked each to give us a definition from their perspective of what creativity means. Betsy was the only one not in the room, so we asked Betsy, what, how would you put into your own words what you have an advantage on because you heard the talk of <laughs> Well, how would you put creativity into or what do you think it means? Bringing forth an idea. Bringing forth an idea. How's that different from having an idea? Is just having an idea creative? So bringing forth would be what? Well, like in pain, if you have um, an idea of a beautiful flower, you hmm. paint. Painting. First I thought you said pain. In pain, if you have <laughs> the idea of a beautiful flower, <laughs> which is a good de definition of uh, Cognitive therapy, you know, think, think nice thoughts and uh, to help mitigate uh, suffering. But Zen or Buddhism is not, uh, and I know you're not saying that, but uh, I think sometimes people think of Zen as kind of cognitive therapy. Think nice thoughts, you know, uh, be pleasant, be happy, be calm, and there, thereby mitigate suffering. And I think that's true. We have to. We don't want to take away all the all the uh, spiritual candy, you know. <laughs> we want to dangle some of those carrots because they're true. Uh, it does happen that if you practice Zen, and again, it's still not long enough, things do change. And one of the things that changes is your own reactivity. We say we don't change the roller coaster, right? You still have the ups and downs. So would you like to sit closer? I'm okay. Okay, done. Ups and downs on the roller coaster, um, but the way I think about it is, when you step off the roller coaster at the end of the ride, you step off the same place you got on, right? Unless you're unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and in doing so, all of the ups and downs have leveled up or even up. <laughs> it's like walking around the block. You know, you can leave the Zen Center here in Atlanta. If you go out and go around the block, it's a pretty big block there. You go up hills and down hills before you get back, but when you come back, it's all canceled out completely because you're right back where you started. So, um, our imagination is very powerful, and that's a double edged sword. It can go uh, south or it can, it can be very helpful. So, for instance, if you have pain in your practice, and you say, and it's the typical knee-jerk reaction, it's pain, I can't stand it, something's wrong, it needs to stop, I need to do something else, right? It's a reinforcing mechanism, it kind of digs you deeper and deeper into the same hole. So Zen practice is a way of uh, confronting experience in such a way that you question it. 
uh, we don't simply continue to accept that what we have always called pain, we actually understand, and that it's actually pain, and so therefore negative, and so forth. And we should try to avoid it. We allow ourselves to experience more deeply uh, whatever experience we're having. So if it's pain in the legs, it's pain in the legs. And, but we don't, uh, we challenge whether or not that's true. You know, we've always reacted that way. And, and as children, you're taught uh, these ideas on how to react. And it's not a good idea for your, your legs to be hurting for very long, and so forth. So as that gets to something very fundamental, which is our causes and conditions of our existence and the causes and conditions of the way we are, and uh, recognizing it as conditioning in the classical sense, that much of it is what we call conditioning, that is, you've been taught these things. And so our practice of Zazen is largely, as I said earlier, a process of subtracting. And another way of expressing that is unlearning. Unlearning what we've already learned, and what we think we know. Uh, fortunately for us, our uh, family Dharma name is Un. It means cloud. My Dharma name Tai Un means great cloud. So Un is uh, a very important word for us. Unlearning is not simply forgetting or denying the truth of something that one knows, but to see the rest of the story, you might say, to see the other side of it. Yes, it's pain. It's what we've always called pain. But what is pain? We don't really know. And so, Buddha was said to have said that uh, you only imagine that you're sitting in pain. I have no idea where that comes from, but I've been told this. So that's pretty harsh. <laughs> if you, you know, if you think you're, you're the one creating this uh, situation for yourself. Now, uh, Matsuoka, she had a pretty moderate middle way uh, of approaching this, although he described the middle way as the razor's edge, the most extreme position of all. Like the razor's edge would just keep cutting through everything no matter what happens, good, bad, and different, just keep cutting through. So in a way it's not at all a moderate position, it's the most extreme position. It's walking the tightrope, it's the razor's edge. But nonetheless, in, in dealing with something uh, like our normal knee-jerk reaction uh, to experience. Instead of uh, uh, simply going with it, simply uh, re reacting and, and becoming discouraged, he used the word encourage a lot, that we are to encourage ourselves, encourage each other in this practice because we're all going to hit tough spots. But just to continue, not to give up, don't give up, was one of the fundamental instructions. Whatever happens, don't give up, just keep going. Uh, when we come to these unpleasant circumstances, unpleasant experiences, uh, rather than grit our teeth and sort of um, bowl our way through it, he would often uh, remark that this is not an endurance contest, you know. This is not macho macho zen. This is, um, if your legs hurt, uncross them, cross them the other way. So when you get sick, you just get sick. When you die, you just die. Which is probably an old Chinese quote. But in the meantime, you go to the doctor, you see if there's really something wrong, do what the doctor says, you know. So it's, uh, moderate or middle way in that way, but it does not uh, give us the out <laughs> of saying, okay, this is too painful, this is too something, this is too anything, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this anymore, this isn't working, working for me. Uh, most people, especially in the West, the biggest percentage of the population of Zen practitioners, and this is one of the points he makes in one of these talks, is that uh, people quit too soon, you know. And it could be after years and years and years, but they finally decide there's either something wrong with themselves, something wrong with them, something wrong with their teacher, mostly, usually, 
something wrong with something, which is my excuse, right? That I'm looking for a way out. And I finally find something, aha, you know, and now I can quit. So he would often caution to be very careful about that one little thing you allow yourself. You know, you're so perfect in everything you do in your life is you're living so hard and dedicated, right? So it's okay if I just do this, you know. <laughs> I can allow myself that one little thing. Now, in my case, there are probably 108 of those little things. So, so does anybody remember how they define creativity this morning? Uh, I think I just talked about that in art, it was a formalized or stylized expression of creativity, but that the root of it is all the way down. Yes. Expression, I think, there is the important point, one of the important points you made. And uh, I want to make a point about expression. In Zen, there are two great parallel tracks, you might say, that are recognized as sort of the essence of the practice. One is called experience, and one is called expression. And many people these days, uh, young people who have been practicing for some time, are maybe on the disciple path or considering it and so forth, we'll often bring up a point such as, uh, well, how do I explain this to somebody else, right? And in some cases it's valid because it's, uh, I'm married to a Christian, I'm married to a Muslim, uh, we're deciding how to raise our children, their in-laws <coughs> want to know why I'm a, why I'm a Buddhist. Why I call myself a Buddhist, you know. So there, there are reasons for having this come up and why. But in many cases, it seems to be putting the cart before the horse. You're worried about how do I explain this to somebody else when you can't even explain it to yourself, right? And you haven't gotten to the point where you, you don't have to explain it to anybody else or something, you know. It's a little premature. So in our practice, experience comes first. Expression later, or maybe never, right? So in Buddha's order, it was said that many of his disciples had it, but did not have the use of it. Meaning they were fully enlightened, you might say, or they had profound insight, they had great understanding, uh, they had experienced themselves, uh, what Buddha was trying to point to in his teachings. But they didn't have the use of it. They were not expected to. They, they didn't necessarily want to. They had no desire to teach. They had no desire to do anything other than live this life and as an example, you know, teach others. But they were not very good at putting things into words. They were not, and so forth. And the other point is the expression of Zen in the history, the long history of Zen has always been in a variety of media. It's been very creative. There have been, there have been great artists in the history of Zen. There have been great poets. There have been some who were great poets and great artists at the same time. Sculptors. Uh, other people, such as uh, Keizan Zenji, a couple of generations after Dogen, who was a genius at establishing monasteries and so forth. He, just, he was carrying on Dogen Zen, but in a very different way than Dogen did. There have been great organizational geniuses in the history of Zen, great literary geniuses. Uh, some who stand out as what in jazz are called monsters, you know, they're so good they're scary. Like Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, whoever, you know. They're the monsters of Zen, you know, like Bodhidharma, uh, Dogen. Uh, you know, you can run down the list, there's at least a dozen that pop out coming to mind right away. Who somehow were able to have a transformative effect on the society that they were in. Now we're in the first 50 to 100 years of introducing Buddhism to the West. So it's kind of the most interesting time, but it's also <laughs> it's also the most frustrating time. First hundred years are the hardest, somebody said. So we have no idea what effect our practice is going to have on the future of Zen. But Matsuoka Roshi was convinced that the future of Zen lay here in America. It's revival, it's rebirth. At least in the West, including Europe, I suppose. Although we have reasons to doubt that. <laughs> And, again, I thought it would be late practice. So, our creativity wants to extend to how we reinvent them. 
I think uh, everybody has to reinvent Zen, uh, one way or the other. Uh, we end up reinventing Zen. And uh, sometimes we do so in the form of expression, but it's more important to think of doing that in the form of experience. So when we study the Dharma, when we hear, listen to a talk like this, when we come to a retreat, it's all pointing at what happens essentially when we're on the cushion. That's, you might think of it, that is the most intense uh, focal point of the practice. People are not only too concerned with how do they begin to express Zen to others, they're also more too concerned with how do I apply this to life. Again, that's a form of expression. And if your practice and your experience on the cushion is genuine, you don't have to worry about how to apply it. It will apply itself to your life. Don't, don't worry about that. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, we have to rediscover or reinvent what Buddha discovered, or you might say invented. It's a little hard to say he invented it, but in the context of his time, none of the teachings that he had been exposed to did it. This is why Buddha is so highly revered, because he was the founder he had no teacher. Somehow, whatever in him was uh, crystallized to that point uh, reads as desperation, frustration, estrangement from existence, not understanding suffering. Uh, it was so strong that it brought about this revelation in his experience. Then, he, you know, they say he was, the story is that he resolved to sit there and die if need be because he couldn't live. So he was suicidal. You could just, you could say he was suicidal in a very basic way, you know, in a very all-encompassing way. He wasn't angry about a given circumstance. He wasn't angry with his parents. He wasn't, you know, trying to show somebody uh, something by killing himself off. Uh, so it wasn't a kind of post, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, post-adolescent uh, uh, trauma that he was going through very genuine, deep, and heartfelt. And fortunately for us, he didn't die. And he had a kind of experience which he, 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 we describe as dying on the cushion. And then, fortunately again, he made a, an effort, decided he could make an effort to try to teach this, even though he couldn't even tell that there was something there that could be taught. So, this kind of gives you the horns of the dilemma. Right? But here's a creative dilemma for you. You've had something You've had this profound experience to the point that everybody around you looks like zombies walking in, in a nightmare. <coughs> and, you know, on the streets there are corpses, there are, you know, crazy people, there's all kinds of disease, there's all kinds of war going on. I mean, that's all hidden from us. You know, we see something on television like it's a game and the bombs are falling in Iraq. But it's not right there. It's not outdoors. And uh, if somebody dies, they're trundled away to the funeral home right away and patched up, cleaned up, made to look pretty and stuck out there so we can look at them or they're not even, we close the box or we cremate them right away so nobody has to, you know, we're, we're hidden from uh, the butch butchery of where our food comes from and the factory farm, you know, that's all disguised. So we have been removed, 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 layer by layer by layer by layer from reality. And so we live in this kind of fictional world. So it takes something as strong and as intense as Zazen to bring us back into the present moment of reality, to be able to face some degree of reality uh, in our culture. But it wasn't like that in Buddha's time. Uh, this is why the story goes the family tried to keep him protected, where he wasn't exposed to that. So, I guess that was a diatribe. But you get my point. Uh, creativity starts with and ends with, right here at home, and how we address life, how we address our existence. So, again, as we were saying this morning, it doesn't have anything to do with specific activity or media that, in which you might be engaged. We like to think of people as creative because they're a writer, a photographer, an artist, a painter, this or that. And that leaves all the portion of meals who aren't that, 
It's just, you know, chopped liver or something. They're, they're not creative. That's unfair. It's not true. But when it comes to Zen, uh, we say, that we don't pretend we're God or anything, but we say that this is creative. Right? This existence is creative. It's creating at all times. I am creating it, or it's creating me. It doesn't matter which way you put it, you know. But moment by moment, this has been created and recreated and recreated. And then with the little gesture we had yesterday of this and then step into, we don't have to step into the moment. We're flowing into the moment at all times. We can't stop. We can't go back. We can't, <laughs> we can't go backwards. We have no choice in this matter, right? Dogen's expression was like a snake molting its skin, but continuously. So it's as if, you know, if you want to put an axis to it, you can say, time is that way, you know. We're the razor's edge, we're going this way, and time is flowing this way, and at the same time it's molting our skin behind us as we go, and this is a new being every moment. Now, we, it's hard for us to catch up to that, so, because it's moving too fast. But when we settle down into Zazen, this is when we can speed up to the present moment. Or you might say we can slow down to, in the terms of a busy mind, right? Slow down to the present moment and begin to experience the rapid change that is this universe, or is this reality. So, in, uh, we haven't, uh, you may not have read it, but in one of Dogen's fascicles called uh, Utsubaraishin, Establishment of the Bodhi Mind, he makes the point that we cannot really establish the Bodhi mind outside of taking the Bodhisattva vow to heart, where we vow to help all other beings before ourselves, or along with ourselves, you might, say, you might think of it that way. There's no establishment of the Bodhi mind independent of that. So there are no independent enlightened beings who can become enlightened without that. Well, this is a very almost politically correct sounding idea, right? But it's just sort of a statement of fact that there's no possibility of any one being separating from the rest of being and then and thereby becoming liberated. It doesn't work that way. So I thought I'd pass around an example of what we were talking about earlier, where these teachings are expressed in words, right? They come down as written words and spoken words. They're called the spoken teachings. But Buddha himself never heard these teachings. Buddha was not a Buddhist, any more than Christ was a Christian. But Buddha had an experience, and the root word Buddha means awake. Buddha woke up. So when the monks he'd been traveling with saw him, said, what are you? Because he was different. He apparently appeared different. He said, I'm awake. I am fully awake. So his Buddha means fully awakened one. Um, so he had the task, creative task, of trying to now express this somehow so that other people could get it. And the story goes that he reasoned that much like the lotus flower statues, sculptures that you see on our altar in Atlanta, or you see, which were from Chicago originally, they were Matsokas, you see many uh, times, they, he, re he, he re reasoned that people must be like the lotus boss and all in different stages. You know, like in the seed in the muck and mire at the bottom of the pond and the growing through the water to clear water and to clear light and finally blooming and so forth and going to seed and folding back up. So he reasoned that somebody, they might be able to get it at different levels. And so his teaching expression through his career, if you follow his teachings from what is called the first sermon of the uh, Four Noble Truths all the way through to the Lotus Sutra, which was supposed to be his last, said to have been his last teaching. You can see the arc of his teaching is getting more and more subtle, more and more contradictory, more and more abstract, more and more difficult to grasp, logically, in words. And so the way I think of this is he was learning the last 50 years of his life, his experience was somewhere in his early 30s. Uh, about the same age as Jesus was crucified. <laughs> Two different stories, right? But Buddha had this 50 years or so, to, uh, according to the story, if you believe the story, where he was expounding the Dharma. 
And we think of this as both he's clarifying it to himself as well as to others. And he would return to the Christian and meditate even after the profound insight he had had. So this is known as the tradition of practice after enlightenment. Uh, enlightenment or awakening is not seen to be an end. This is why awakening is a better word. It's a gerund. Awakening implies a process that's ongoing. Whereas enlightenment sounds like some kind of fixed goal we attain. We think of enlightenment as just what brought us all here today. We're enlightened to the fact something is missing in our life. We're enlightened to the fact that we don't know what it is. We're enlightened to the fact that Buddhism seems to know, seems to be pointing at this. And so we come here as so we're already enlightened by being here. This is the best, I think, definition of enlightenment, or prosaic, down to earth. It just means, like the Oxford, uh, anybody not know the Oxford story, the Oxford pictures? We'll, we'll get into that later. Uh, recognizing that there's some truth in the world that's missing and looking and seeking it out, pursuing it. So now that we're here and we're attending this retreat and we're and so forth, we're putting enlightenment into practice. So this is what Dogen referred to as practice enlightenment, one word. Uh, you can't separate the two. So Enlightenment in that sense is not yet awakening. It's not yet the transformational experience of Buddha's awakening that is pointed to in the, in the story, in the history. And then the story of the transmission of the land from teacher to stu student, teacher to student, all the way down through the lineage. So, with that sort of preamble, I'm just going to pass this around. I think some of you have seen this. This is an attempt I made to translate these teachings into visuals. So, uh, in design there is a uh, kind of a special category or special concept or niche idea of translating information into visible means so that it's easily, easily grasped. Because again, as we said this morning, words are one-dimensional, right? Images are two-dimensional, and so you have a little more oomph to them. Remember the teachings, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Six Paramitas, the Five Skandhas, the this, the that, you know, the Twelvefold Way. All of these enumerations are said to have been mnemonics, <coughs> attempts and ways of making these teachings memorable. Remember that for the first 400 years or so, they were not written down. They were considered too sacred, and it was also uh, known that if you had to learn these orally, you couldn't mess with them. <laughs> you couldn't change them. Once something is written, anybody can change it who's copying it, even by accident. And so we think the oral tradition preserved the teachings in that way, whereas once they began to be written, they were subject to manipulation. So when we look at the uh, Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Chain, the Heart Sutra, the Twelve links in the chain of interdependent origination, they're just like a noodle on the page, you know, they're very difficult to read. But when you translate them into a, what is called a semantic model, and this is something I learned from Buckminster Fuller, who was one of my mentors, who was the inventor of the geodesic dome, for those of you who may not know his name, but he was a great philosopher um, as well, and understood language even understood relativity, to communicate with Einstein on relativity. Uh, he and a guy named Hayakawa at Southern California, University of Southern California, at that time were doing what is called semantic modeling, meaning they would build models of language that were three-dimensional. So taking that as an inspiration, uh, I took the Four Noble Truths and created them as four points in space, which makes a tetrahedron which according to Fuller is the first system because it divides the universe into inside outside. Simplest geometric system, simplest geometry for representing a system is the four-pointed model. That can be used to define a business, a, an organism, anything that has an inside and outside. And then I related the various teachings for the path, of course, it's just an expansion into the Eightfold Path. But for um, cessation, it's uh, an expansion into um, 
the six paramitas, which are also necessary to the cessation, uh, for the how things got to be the way they are, the origin. The, the other, the more expanded model of that is the 12-fold chain of interdependent origination, right? And the five uh, skandhas are another way of saying the existence of suffering, and here's how it exists. It exists in these five divisions. So I'll pass that over on. Let's take a quick look at it. We don't want to dwell on it. But what that is, is uh, so the models here uh, have been converted to graphic models, so they can be printed on a page. And so they can plant an image in one's head, and this becomes a mnemonic for remembering that. And the interconnection of them shows how they interrelate, and how this teaching is really the same as the teaching of the, or the that there is the existence of suffering, and here's how it exists, and so forth, as you go through the form of the truths. So where we left off this morning was with um, Hike. We were talking about the creativity in words being mostly associated with poetry, and uh, when we think of poetry and Zen, we think of Hike poetry, the 575 uh, form. And I think it's important to remember that that form is pretty much like those forms. If you're constructing a poem, uh, and you at least have a framework of 575, right, you've got something to go with, something to help you. It's like, uh, Barbara Cohen said, uh, our practice is like the lattice that the vine grows on. Right? The vine is not geometric. It's not or or orderly that way. It has a much higher level of order, which of course we think of as chaos. <laughs> chaos is a higher level of order. But our practice is the vine upon which this organic thing can grow. And so it assists it. So I think this is like that. And if you think of high poetry as being 575, uh, there were other forms of poetry extant at the same time where I would chant a verse and then you would chant, then you would make up the next few lines and then I would make up the remainder of it. And that's a game you can play with. I could say, I don't think we should, you do seven, right? And then I'd do another five. <laughs> So, uh, hike poetry, imagine this, imagine, okay, I'm going to write a poem, but it doesn't, it's not going to rhyme, uh, it's not going to have any particular form. In fact, it's not necessarily going to start here and go that way, it may go from here that way, but it also may go that way, it could go that way, or it could come this way. You know? uh, for the artist, the painter, they say the most terrifying thing is the blank page. Because with a blank page, everything is still possible. Right? As soon as you make the first mark, everything is no longer possible. Only what you've already started has become possible at this point. With a camera. You know, what if you had a camera that could take a picture of everything? <laughs> the only reason photography works is what it leaves out. <laughs> so, you can focus somebody's attention on this detail of the universe at the moment, a snapshot as we call it. So this is a, a way of understanding form and emptiness. <coughs> emptiness may be the truth, but it's the most terrifying dimension of form. Thank you. Have you made sculpture of that? I have. I actually have. I've built models and take them in, hold them up, and do a lecture with the model. And then one, one, of the, one of the people said, you should build those and sell them. Yeah. <laughs> Big market for that. <laughs> do this ticker toys. <laughs> so it's almost Our seven. And I know we're supposed to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tried to make them a little more sophisticated. Um, I know we're almost at 7 o'clock, and I'm willing to go as long as anybody's willing to go, but is there any program after 7, or is that it for today? Okay, well let's just go and we'll talk as long as anybody else wants to talk. But I want to squeeze in some reading of Matsuoka's teaching. And by the way, we're going on to Kokyo, which is the Eternal Mirror. That's the new study subject of Dogen's Festival for the month of May. So beginning Tuesday night, we'll have our first Skype conference on that. And there's so many things in that that I wanted to read to you that have to do with the same subject. 
about poetry and about expression and so forth. But it's an extremely long one. And it's going to take a whole month to just scratch the surface with Kokyo. So this is uh, Sensei about the hike. And this is back in 1963. Wherever there is poetic action, and this is, this is a quote, by the way, but he doesn't attribute it, which he did that a So this maybe is from China or Japan. Wherever there is poetic action, a religious aspiration, a heroic thought, a union of nature within man and the nature without, there is Zen. Let me read that again. See the lightning? They heard it. Wherever there is poetic action, a religious aspiration, a heroic thought, a union of the nature within man and the nature without, there is Zen. So Sensei goes on to comment, this Zen can be known by all these things and by its vastness. The attempt to explain Zen often just makes it more obscure. So that's my excuse. But Zen can be known by the power of its spiritual life in action. Zen should be known by experience, not just by the mind. For Zen is like life. Life re reveals itself most clearly when it is not clutched at with the feelings or intellect. Life is momentary. We are in accord with it to the extent that we move with it. But when we stop to philosophize about it, we miss a beat. When we try to philosophize about Zen, we fail to truly know its vastness. I'm going to stop there for a moment and just say, but we can't help it, right? That's the, the horns of the dilemma we're on. So he goes on to say, it was said that Zen can be found in poetry. It is well known that Zen is the inspiration for the startling poems called Hike. I like my rhythm section. <laughs> <laughs> These poems, written in Japanese, have the unique quality of a profound simplicity and directness, and seem to say that the answer to the problem of life is so obvious, one need not look for it. The Hike poem tells us that we are looking in obscure places for what is in broad daylight. It is not that we have not looked enough for its secret, looked enough for its secret, it, we have looked too much. Hike poems tell us that the secret of life is to be found in everyday life. These simple poems reveal a moment of intense perception when the moment of being alive is known in an unusually vivid way and we become acutely aware of the vastness of things and our part in them. In the Hike poem, this vastness is clear when it is seen without the need for questions. The Hike reveals a way of living and seeing life that is able to pierce the illusions of the phenomenal world and disclose the spiritual power we need for our lives. When we listen to the Hike, we can sense the nature of all things and the inspiration of Zen. In our meditation, we begin to know the Buddha nature to be found in ourselves and other things, and in turn, we more fully understand the depth and meaning of the hike. But this is a spiritual world that is poorly described by words. The hike gives us a glimpse of the boundless spiritual power that can be known in our lives. This spiritual power comes from Zen, and in it, and, and it is there to be found in the simplest of things. The secret to this power of life is to be found in everything. The flower, the long dark night, the flowing brook, the wind, and in ourselves. The hike tells us that this spiritual life can be known in nature. And when one has seen it, there is the union of one's nature within and this nature without. Let me say that again. When one has seen it, there is the union of one's nature within and this nature without. When a person truly understands the hike and truly knows Zen, they know that these natures are one and the same. When we know this, the spiritual power has already become our life, and we no longer think or speak about it. And he goes on to say, this is the kind of power that can be found in a religious aspiration or a world thought. So, <clears throat> so in the closing here, uh, he talks about Soto Zen teaches that Shakyamuni Buddha gave up his fortune 
uh, to live a life of simplicity and of the Spirit in this world, we should do the same. This simplicity can be found in a high poem I would like to tell you about. This poem shows the simplicity and profundity that can be the life of anyone. In English, the high poem can be translated as, When there is need for a warming fire, the gentle wind blows the dried leaves to provide it. Now in English, that's not 17 syllables. This poem describes the simple life that can be led close to nature instead of one of riches. A scene that is described is contrasted with that of people who spend much money to buy fuel to heat for warmth. A simple pile of leaves could provide as much warmth as the costly pile of wood. These days, you think, a simple rake could pick up those leaves instead of those leaf floors that are going on all day long. <laughs> Our lives should be simple and in the way of the Buddha. The secret of life is to be found in everyday life. Do not look elsewhere for it! Exclamation point. Zen is within you only to be discovered. This world is the enlightened world. Everyone can reach enlightenment, not just a few. So, okay. And I, just, I have to add something. Okay. Every Tuesday morning, there's a crew of three people, two with leaf blowers, and they have to wear hard hats, and then the gentleman that tells them how to blow the leaves, but he doesn't wear a hard hat, because he doesn't get close to the work. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Yeah, a leaf might hit them in the head. <laughs> I just, sometimes I just go out and stand there and watch those guys, and hope they catch me watching them, I just... A game, you know. They're pushing like six leaves. Yeah, two, three blocks down the street. So I wanted to say one more thing and one more poem here um, from uh, the one we're studying along with Dogen's Kokyo. It's a Enlightenment chapter or section. A scarecrow, a scarecrow in the grain field is the is the one we're studying from Matsuoka this month. Also from 1963. And this one has the Japanese calligraphy. Somehow the calligraphy got lost in the other one. Dogen Zenji, who introduced Japan to the religious teachings which later became known as those of the Soto Zen sect, once wrote in his collection of religious poems under the title Sitting in Meditation. And this is the English translation. Though it has no thought of keeping watch, it is not for naught that the scarecrow stands in the grain field. Though it has no thought of keeping watch, it is not for naught that the scarecrow stands in the grain field. At first glance, we may see little relationship to sitting in meditation in these words, but if we ponder seriously about them for a moment, we might see that other persons might think of us as scarecrows as they see us sitting silently in meditation. <laughs> In fact, one Buddhist priest did look at meditation as useless. The priest Ippen, who founded the Yugyoji Temple of Fujisawa in the 13th century contemporary Dogen, felt that way. Although he was a great man and founder of a sect, he failed to understand the true value of sitting in meditation and of uniting wisdom and practice. He wrote that, quote, not even dancing or skipping helps us on to salvation. How can sitting drowsily bring emancipation? His sect relied on the Amida Buddha for deliverance from suffering, that is, on a power outside of oneself, and not on that which we ourselves might achieve. Priest Ippen thought of meditation as sitting dully. How many of us fail to understand the true meaning of sitting in meditation and do not experience the merging of its wisdom and practice? In Dogen Zenji's words, the scarecrow does not stand in the grain field for nothing. In Japan during the harvest, farmers set up life-size straw dummies of themselves in the fields to scare away the birds, much as is done in this country. The dummies perform their duty in silence and are of great benefit to the farmers who might otherwise lose the fruit of their fields. In Zen meditation also, we sit silently and might appear to be like these scarecrows. We must have faith in our sitting in this manner and truly feel that it is a religious practice which has boundless meaning. 
And this is important. I'm not going to go much further. Soto Zen meditation is not the sitting which preceded Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment, but the seat, sitting at the very moment of his newfound wisdom. Soto Zen meditation is not the sitting which preceded Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment, but the sitting at the very moment of his newfound wisdom. The Buddha had been sitting in deep silence, much like the manner in which each of us sits in his daily or weekly meditation. He sat with his legs crossed, his hands clasped, sitting upright, regulating his breath, keeping his mind pure of evil passions or of any thoughts. Yet, the Buddha's meditation was much more than just sitting in silence, for his mind had reached an open and free world where everything was embraced and the distinction of self and not self had been done away with. The Buddha had seen things as they really are, but this does not mean that he was blessed with an insight into some mysterious things. The shell of his egotistical self had been smashed, and it was as if he were the only being in the universe, or as if he had become one with the whole universe. The wisdom of the true nature of things became fused with his practice of sitting in meditation. Because the two were inseparable, the practice of sitting must be thought of as wisdom itself. The outward form of sitting in meditation may not appear to have much meaning in itself, but once the spirit of the Buddha's enlightenment is fused into it, it takes on the highest values. So then he quotes Dogen again. Dogen Zinji praised this posture, saying, The Buddha is in all directions as numerous as the sons of the Ganji, sand grains of the Ganges River would be unable to estimate the merits of an hour sitting in meditation by a single person. To Dogen Zinji, there was no dualism in mind and matter. Now there he's he's quoting from Bindawa, and in these days none of those things were translated. So since he was translating all this himself, and there uh, at the very end of the uh, uh, section of Bindawa, which uh, ends at the questions section and begins with uh, one translation says uh, now all ancestors and all Buddhas who uphold Buddha Dharma have made it the true path of enlightenment to sit upright practicing in the midst of self-fulfilling samadhi so this samadhi is something we can talk about at greater length but self-fulfilling means that it's not only that it's fulfilling the true self of the being who is practicing it but it is in itself self-fulfilling. It is in itself. Uh, so we enter into samadhi, which is already real or already existing. Everything is sitting in samadhi. And, and at the very end of it, he, he, he says something, uh, translated slightly different than what Sensei is talking about. He said, know that even if uh, all the Buddhas in the ten directions, as innumerable as the sands of the Ganges, exert their strength, and with the Buddha's wisdom, Try to measure the merit of one person Sazen, they will not be able to fully comprehend it. So, the relationship of creativity to Zen cannot circumvent Sazen. <laughs> There's no way you can get uh, Zen from reading about it, or from thinking about it, or conceptualizing, or listening to me, or listening to somebody else. Uh, we have to do the hard work. You just have to do it. Um, but it, it's simple. Just sitting still enough long enough. It couldn't be any simpler. As a designer, as a creative person, I can't see any way to improve it. I've tried. <laughs> because it's been just as hard for me as it is for you, for anyone. It's very similar to the Zafu. It's very difficult to improve on that design. So simple. It's like a bobby pin. You know, these are called classics uh, in design, the design world. So, to my way of thinking, uh, just as uh, Sensei is saying, you cannot separate wisdom and sitting. You can't really separate creativity and Zen. Um, it is the creativity of the moment, and it's expressed on you know, its fullest expression in our Zazen. And that is said to also be the seal of Buddha. That is the seal of Buddha. Now, in, in Jiju Zamai, one of the most 
my favorite really, of all of Dogen's teachings, and one of the most descriptive in a sense uh, of what this is. At one point there, he says, he goes to this just effusive, wonderful praise, and he's like 25 years old, or 20, I don't know, maybe he's 26, 28. He's like a young guy, you know, and you can just hear it in his voice, and, uh, how enthusiastic he is about this. He's like a preacher on a road. And it comes to the end of a section where he's saying something like, um, because of this, all those who live with you and speak with you will obtain endless but of virtue <laughs> and unroll widely inside and outside of the entire universe. The endless, unremitting, unthinkable, unnameable. And then he says, however, <laughs> all of this does not appear within perception because it is unconstructedness and stillness. It is immediate realization. If practice and realization were two things as it appears to the ordinary person, each could be recognized separately. But what can be met with recognition is not realization itself because realization is not reached by a deluded mind. So, any form of perception is, in a sense, a form of delusion. This is something that goes beyond perception. So, then he says, nevertheless, because you're in the state, oh no, he says, in stillness, in stillness, mind and object merge in realization and go beyond enlightenment. So this is what Sensei is talking about when he says, when we're sitting in meditation, if we finally experience this sort of unification principle of where it all comes together and we don't have these contradictionless, confusing, that we're making up, confusing us. Mind and not in stillness. In stillness is the key. Right? Mind and object merge in realization and go beyond enlightenment. So to my way of thinking, this is the payoff. This is the ultimate creativity. Um, Matsuo Karoshi would often say, what else can give you back your whole life? Right? What else have you put your time and effort and so forth into can have such a big payoff? Anyway, the words often, as he mentions and Dogen mentions elsewhere, create flowers in the air. Sometimes create more confusion than clarity. But I hope this commentary is been somewhat clarifying. Let's start with Don and see if you have any closing question or comment. Anything that stood out for you? Or is unclear? Hard to imagine anything I say being unclear. I can't create it right now. <laughs> Probably best to leave it alone. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Got about 35 seconds left of battery life okay. left. If anybody has an important question, do it now. Corey? No? Hey. Well said. <laughs> you could just be imitating him. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what did he say? What did he say? I said you might just be imitating him. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Silence is not always golden. Uh, I have a question, but it'll be more than thirty-five seconds. Oh, okay, that's right. Um, it's uh, I have a question about um, conditional, conditioned arising, yeah. and volition. How would you How tell us some more about that? What's the day? difference in your mind? What's the um, difference? I'm wondering how to reconcile the two. That uh, if if all things arise through conditions, and volition is and that means our decisions, intention. right? Our decisions also arise through. So you're talking about fatalism? Is it fate versus free will? Free will yeah, free something will. like that. What makes you ask? Well, um, I guess in terms of uh, uh, normal practicing creativity, arts, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, creative decisions. Yakujo's fox illustrated this. This is a famous story, Yakujo's fox, uh, where uh, he was, this old man always appeared at the uh, back of the talk, and uh, he came up, he stayed one day, he was always disappeared at the end of the talk, 
came up and talked to was it Basho? Uh, Basho, I believe. Oh, it was Yakujo. He came up and talked to Yakujo. Okay, so, uh, and he said, you know, listen to your lectures, and he said, I was uh, once abbot of this monastery 500 lifetimes ago or something, you know, a long time ago, I was abbot of the same monastery, and somebody asked me the question, is the enlightened person subject to or free from causality? It's the same question you're asking. And he said, uh, I answered free from, and was condemned to be reborn as a fox for 500 lifetimes. <laughs> so, he said, so he said, please help me, please tell me the truth. So, Kapujo is very sweet, translated, but he said, the enlightened person is one with causality. Or the enlightened person does not ignore causality. So, and the story goes that Yakujo, one day, went out with a stick and poked the corpse of a fox out from under a bush and had them perform a full priest ceremony burial for this fox. <laughs> and then, then he told this story. So, does that come close? <laughs> Anyone else before we close? So we want to close with the after next ten. Let's do let, let's do it for once the way we do it in uh, Atlanta, and we'll follow you. We do the we do three bells and stop. Small bell. Okay. Yeah, three bells and stop, and then we chant the four bells three times, and then on the very last line, strike the bell twice on the last line as we're closing. So, uh, I'm going stop. Census English translation. There are so many, and none of them are perfect. Right? Um, we're all happy when we just chant Japanese because everybody chants it the same way. But if you go to a Thai temple or a Chinese <coughs> temple, it's very, very, very different. It's the same sutra. So it requires flexibility of mind to accept these differences. Uh, it requires flexibility of mind to accept a teacher and to follow that teacher. And at a given point, it requires the flexibility of mind to innovate, uh, change uh, how the teaching is taught. These are all on the expedient means side 
of Zen and creativity. Thank you for your patience and listening. And any announcements for Bonnie?